Welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. Today, we have on Roy Richard Grinker. He's a professor of anthropology, international affairs, and human sciences at the George Washington University. He's a cultural anthropologist specializing in ethnicity, nationalism, and psychological anthropology with topical expertise in autism, uh, Korea, and sub-Saharan Africa. He's also the director of George Washington's Institute for Ethnographic Research and editor-in-chief of the journal Anthropological, Anthropological Quarterly, and he's the author of several books, including Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism, and his newest book is called Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. Welcome, Richard. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much again, obviously, for coming on. Uh, so the thing before we actually get into the topic that we want to talk about, what was so interesting to me is your your actual background and kind of the medical history of your family. So I, I, this is, I mean, a curiosity for me. So I had to ask. So how is it that you have a family of therapists, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, and then you became an anthropologist, but then your specialty became psychiatry and psychology anyway? So was there some sort of kind of dissonance initially where you were like, hey, I kind of want to rebel, but then you were like, oh, I'm brought back into the fold? Or was it a little bit something or was it something else? else yeah thanks leon i mean that's a great question i um uh, i think you're right it was a lot of rebellion but it was also that my I, I don't just come from a family of psychiatrists and psychoanalysts i come from a family of psychiatrists and psychoanalysts who uh sort of fostered a kind of idolization of them mm -hmm. um and i just thought there's no way i can compete no way i can get into this field and so I kind of, you know, self-sabotaged in science and uh, did well in humanities and social science classes. But, you know, once I matured, mm -hmm. that rebellion turned into a realization that I think psychologically. I mean, that's how I was raised. I think about what other people are are going through and how they're motivating their behaviors and their ideas. And, and um, when I discovered that I could think psychologically and research psychologically in a field outside of psychiatry, I embraced it. And that was anthropology. Um, mm -hmm. And that it's interesting because that allowed me to rebel too, because I could look critically at my sort of the history of Western psychiatry and say, look, if we, if we go and look at other societies, other cultures, or even back in our own history, we can gain a critical perspective and say, you know, this is wrong, or this is helpful, or th or this this doesn't seem to be logical. Anthropology helps you to really um, criticize your own society. You know, we we always tell our students that anthropology is about the study of other cultures, but it's really about the study of other cultures in order to sort of look back and see your own culture in a new light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what have you discovered from other cultures? Because we often think of mental illness, mental health, just generally in this Western model, you know, what, what do they call the weird model, right? Why Western people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right. And so what have you discovered, especially in terms of, um, so I hesitate to use the term, but I'm going to use it for lack of a better word, uh, for the more kind of primitive cultures. Uh, what have you discovered in contrast, you know, to our model, you know, elsewhere in the world, how do they treat and understand mental illness? Well, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the weird thing, you know, the weirdest people in the world, what, what, who were the subjects of so all the psychological research, right? White, educated, mm -hmm. industrialized, what are the others? Rich, democratic, whatever. Mm -hmm. mostly yeah, college yeah. I forgot it too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're mostly college students. And, uh, and if you go and look abroad, you find that there are just, you know, there are fundamental differences at the basic psychological cognitive level, even of perception of depth and things like that. But, but also that, that people think differently about aberrations, about diversity. You know, we've developed this thing in, in Western civilization since the late 1800s that if somebody's different, they're excluded, right? Mm -hmm. They're isolated, they're put in asylums, they're put in special schools or whatever it might be. And in the societies that I've lived in, in um, whether it's in, in Swaziland or Democratic Republic of Congo, where I did, um, I, I spent two years. Right. Um, when when somebody's sick, they it might be scary. It, it, it might be something where uh, people feel threatened, mm -hmm. but they're not banishing the person. 
-hmm. They're finding ways to keep them in the family. And there are really good longitudinal studies that show that the outcomes of people with serious mental illnesses are better in non-industrialized societies, in rural communities, than they are in industrialized societies. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah, that's a huge, uh, that's a stark contrast between how yeah. we deal with uh, mental health here, for sure. Yeah. No, because it, it's so stigmatized here, right? I mean, you might end up sending someone to a mental, I mean, it might be uh, warranted, but sending someone, let's say, to a, a psychiatric facility where they're sort of separated maybe from their family, not necessarily, um, you know, ne next to people that they, you know, are familiar with, uh, that, that can be quite isolating. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they not only are isolated, but they start to see themselves as bad. I mean, as unworthy, as having low value. If, that, if I've been marginalized, I must be a bad person, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there, are, uh, there was this community that um, I spent time with, uh, the, the Kung San, um, in the Kalahari Desert of, of Botswana, where, you know, there were, there were people there who had... Um, you know, serious intellectual disabilities or serious mental illnesses. But the difference there was that they didn't marginalize people or banish them. They did appreciate what people offered in terms of what they could do, like a six-year-old or seven-year-old boy who has autism and who's nonverbal, but is amazing at tracking all the goats, like knows mm -hmm. where the goats are at any time, can find tools that people have left out in the bush, you know, and they, they talk about this person as having those skills. Mm. And even when there was somebody there who was having um, hallucinations um, and who was kind of frightening, the theory of causation was not oh, there's something wrong with this individual, but rather there's something spiritual or supernatural that randomly happened to affect this individual. It's not his fault, mm -hmm. right? And he's yeah. not made to believe it's his fault, even if at times people are frightened of him. And I, I think that's you know a big thing. It's like this, I, I don't want to simplify it too much, but it's sort of like, you know, the society takes the blame for problems more than just blaming it on the individual right and i wish we have had more of that in you know the past couple of centuries in western civilization where you know you blame the person who is somehow different whether it's neurodiverse or whether they're they're queer whether they are trans you know want to be transgender you blame it on them that there's something wrong with them rather than that the suffering that they feel from being who they are is made possible by the society that mm. imposes those values. Yeah. And people often misunderstand the concept, I think, of neurodiversity. It's actually something that I, for, for the, oh, God, after God knows how long, finally got. So I used to think of neurodiversity as just uh, abnormalities, like abnormal psychology or whatever. Uh, but then the understanding kind of changed. And I was like, oh, I see. So neurodiversity is just a spectrum of the wide diversity of different, let's say, brain wiring of different folks, right? Uh, so when you think about neurodiversity, it's not so much that there's a normal slash abnormal. It's just that there are different pockets of different kinds of people, right? And the autism spectrum is one example of that. And and uh, so, you know, while you were talking, what was so interesting uh, or what I was thinking about, what was so uh, interesting was the link that you had with somebody that I'm really familiar with whose work I really love, Artie Lang. Do you know of him? Yeah. Yeah. So Artie Lang, so just for our audience, uh, so he was one of the first in the Western, you know, the weird, uh, the Western world who was, uh, he didn't necessarily normalize, but he destigmatized schizophrenia. And so what happened was he found a way to take people out of asylums. He created like these communal homes for them. And so for all of his faults, I mean, Artie Lang, uh, trust me, he had many faults. Uh, but the point is to say that he took a group of people who otherwise were shunned and ostracized, and he pretty much gave them a home and allowed them to feel like they were worthwhile. And just for fun, would you yeah. like to get into that one story with Artie Lang. You know, it's so funny. Oh my God. I, I love know. that story. Oh my, yo, that's so funny. I was actually thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. So the, the Artie Lang story. So literally he's in one of these asylums. And so there's this woman there who's just like rocking back and forth. Uh, she's, uh, she had the straight jacket on, you know, like these, uh, whatever cloth like chains, uh, for people who've never seen one of them. Uh, so she has a straight jacket on. And so the head psychiatrist tells Lang, he says, well, you know, she's, she's kind of one of these, like, uh, I guess a deplorable or whatever you, she, we can't, we can't reach her. Yeah. Uh, she's been, you know, biting the staff. She's been throwing feces 
she's at us. She's been cursing us out, whatever, right? So uh, Artie Lang essentially says, oh, you know, I'll go in and I'll go, I'll talk to her. I'll see what's up. And they're like, no, we're not going to let you do that. And he, he said, look, I'm a psychiatrist. Like, can you just give me a chance? So yeah, so essentially he comes in uh, for the first, whatever it was, like five, 10 minutes. She's, you know, yelling at him, cursing him out. Uh, and then essentially he starts, uh, no, she starts, uh, I think they actually took the straight jacket off from my from the, my memory of the story. So they took the jacket off and then essentially she starts taking off her clothes. And then as she starts doing that, Lang does the same thing. He starts taking off his clothes. And then as she goes on the floor, he goes on the floor. And then all of a sudden they have somewhat of a rapport. And then I think he even gives her a cigarette to her at the end and then he starts smoking. And so of course, like the staff there is horrified, especially the psychiatrist. And so they take him out of there and they're like, this is horrendous. We're going to have you written up. You're going to be called in front of an ethics review board. You're like the worst psychiatrist ever. You should have, you should be delicensed or whatnot. But yeah, but this story, and this is a legitimate story. It was uh, in the movie, uh, what's it called? Uh, Mad to be Normal. And so now it's uh, popularized with the David Tenement character. But the point is to say that that story is so great because it shows you the potential of dealing with people who are, you know, considered quote unquote mentally ill. Because the point is to say that maybe not nobody's unreachable, but there are definitely people who at least appear to be unreachable that maybe don't, aren't necessarily so. Yeah. And that's a great story. And I think that, you know, that's sort of, that's sort of an extreme, right? But, right. but if we, you know, take it away from the person who's so seriously um, mentally ill and suffering that they're going to be um, behaving the way that woman did. And we start to look at just sort of the ordinary person who maybe is socially awkward or um, overly shy or has restricted interests and maybe on the autism spectrum. Um, we can also meet that person where they are, right? We can... Um, look at them as not somebody who just needs to be feared or isolated, but somebody who has strengths that we didn't see. Mm -hmm. And I think, and one of the things I've written about in Nobody's Normal is that our society, not always consciously, right? Not always by intention. We have created new kinds of economic and other possibilities, educational, social, that that do meet people at their level. I mean, when I was growing up and I was in school, the person who was interested in things like computers was was the least popular, was bullied, mm -hmm. was treated really, really badly, right? Yeah. The nerd, the geek. And we, we've now, we take those words like nerd and geek. We've turned them into positive things. Today, I'm geeking out on this. Today, I'm nerding out on this, or I'm a sports nerd, or I'm a whatever nerd. We take that and we have new opportunities that have been created by our society that make it possible for them to have successful, meaningful lives and not be bullied all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of revenge of the nerds, in, <laughs> if you, uh, to put it um, in a, a phrase that people are familiar with, uh, shows us that as our societies change, so can the way in which we include or marginalize people. You know, we've okay. done that. We didn't do it on purpose. We didn't say, okay, let's make, you know, a really technological heavy society in order to help these folks. It wasn't intentional, but it happened. And because it happens, it shows us, it empowers us to say, yeah, we, none of this stuff is embedded in nature. It doesn't have to be that way, right? We can change it. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, and there's the whole goal of trying to say that culture is, is creating something is to say uh, that it's not in nature, that it doesn't have to be that way. And that's pretty empowering. We can change things if we want. Yeah, you know what's so funny? So in our friend group, which is like to me the most interesting thing. So like, let's say if uh, we had our friend group, I don't know, uh, like 20 years ago or whatever, right? So like my personality style or my like type would be the dominant one. So like, I really like sports, uh, you know, professional wrestling too, even though that's like, so, it was sort of popular in the nineties anyway. So I don't know if that counts, but what's so funny is like with our friend group, I'm actually kind of the outcast. So they love all of the nerdy stuff. They love like superhero videos and uh, videos, I'm sorry, movies, uh, anime. They love video games, like all this stuff that you would think of like as part of nerd culture, even our friend, Mike, he has a podcast literally called like nerd culture or whatever, or at least the theme is nerd culture. So what's so funny is I would argue that actually now, I'm more of the outsider than like somebody like you guys. You know, it's interesting uh, in terms of uh, what's uh, socially accepted. Honestly, uh, there there are ways to frame things that you're interested in in order that uh, they just seem very interesting and offer value, right? I mean, 
uh, if you essentially, if somebody owns what they do or a group of people own what they do, like making uh, something nerdy, cool, right? Like, oh, I'm a total computer nerd. I love computers. And you really get into it. You could talk about that to somebody who's maybe not usually into it. You can totally convey a whole bunch of uh, value to that and, uh, you know, shape their perception. Right, right. And then on the cultural scale, imagine, you know, we have already transformed nerd culture, right? Yeah, it's a cool thing now. Yeah. Yeah. So and then Richard, you know, to tie this back into your work, right? So we're thinking about this, a lot of a lot of us would think about this more genetically, biologically, uh, it seems like for the most part, our culture is sort of genetically determined, you know, based on kind of our inborn traits or whatnot. But you argue that the culture is this kind of, um, in a way, it's sort of a mystery, right? It's this thing that sort of kind of has its own life or its own, uh, its own kind of breath, right? Uh, so how is it that we tend to conflict with that in terms of our own innate thinking? Because innately, when we think of mental illness, we do think of biological brain disorders, et cetera, right? We think like, okay, well, you know, the culture, it's not really as relevant. You sort of, you you kind of, you're born with these traits or you have, you know, these uh, pretty inevitable dispositions toward, let's say, something like schizophrenia. So, but you actually argue that, no, the environment is probably, if not almost as equally as important as it would, as genetics and the, the person's biology, underlying biology. Yeah. And when I think environment, I think including, you know, family, social yeah. environment. Um, yeah, biology holds us on a leash. There's only so much we can do, mm. but it's a really, really long leash. And we are able to be creative and that's what makes us human. We're, we're able to, to, to do so much that, and, and that's what anthropologists really study is right. That, that, that variation in human behavior. And we know this, uh, about anthropology, you know, if we look back to the beginnings of our discipline, it was really framed as uh, a discipline about questioning whether the way we do things is the right way or the only way, mm. right? So it was assumed back in the 20s and 30s that women were suited for the home and men were suited for the workplace, right? That private, public, domestic, uh, natural yeah naturally that, that was that that was natural yeah and then you know uh people like margaret mead uh mm -hmm. went out to uh new guinea and found societies where uh men and women were thought to be both uh equally aggressive and another <laughs> society where they're both equally passive and another one where women are supposed to be the initiators of lovemaking and not the men. And, wow. and, you know, and she came back and this sort of fueled her feminism to say, look, you know, what we do isn't, isn't the right way or the only way. And if you do anthropological fieldwork in a society that's very different from your own, you start to gain that perspective and say, oh yeah, I guess, I guess we don't have to do it that way. It can be little things. Like when somebody asks you a question, like, um, you know, when I was in doing my field work, is it true that in the United States you torture um, uh, kids when they get to puberty by binding their teeth with metal wires? <laughs> and you think, oh, you mean braces, <laughs> right? And you start to see that the that something that we've just taken for granted can have a very different perspective. And one of the things I do like about some of the history of anthropology, as well as the history of psychiatry, is that, you know, like R.D. Lang, they, you know, have tried to meet people on their level and to empathize and see their logic, you know, how they see the world. Um, one really good example of this uh, for psychiatry, I think, is shell shock. Mm -hmm. um, where uh, shell shock was a term that was developed by patients. It was developed by people who were suffering from trauma in World War I. They'd seen horrific things or perhaps done horrific things. And yet the symptoms of uh, post-traumatic stress were seen as hysteria, a feminized term uh, from the Greek hysterikos, you know, the uterus. Um, it was it was really highly stigmatized, and the uh, the soldiers themselves came up with this term shell shock, and the doctors said that was a good idea. Let's use that. Let's destigmatize the trauma of war. Let's make it possible that people can get treated. And so lots and lots of got of people got treated in World War One for shell shock, 
where they never would have been treated for something like the way we think about PTSD mm. today. Um, even if they'd never been anywhere near combat, mm -hmm. shell shock was still used. Um, and so where psychiatry is done well, in my view, and anthropology is, is you know, is, is changing and saying, what do we need to do in order to make people feel better about getting care and support? Sometimes I'm accused of saying, you know, people think, oh, if you're a neurodiversity advocate, you think there's no such thing as a mental illness. And um, mental illnesses are all just constructed by experts and so-called experts and, and, and scientists. There's no such thing as a disease of autism. It is just neurodiversity. I, I've never said that. Mm -hmm. What I've said is that there are people who suffer mm -hmm. and we have to find ways to alleviate the suffering. Right. So when Lang sits on the floor or takes off an item of clothing to be with this person, I keep going back to your example because it's a really you know, great one. Um, you know, he's basically saying what we have to do is is alleviate suffering. And sometimes having a term or an illness name is fine if right. it yields that kind of benefit. I mean, shell shock yielded a benefit. The concept of PTSD today confers a benefit. Right. Right. So, and a really important point that I just, can I just really quickly? So, okay. In terms of just the DSM. So we had on Andrew Skull and I think it was last August. So, and I look, I love Andrew Skull. I love his work really deeply respect him. I feel like his book, um, desperate remedies is legitimately one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, so I just, I want to really quickly like give his argument because I, I want to kind of give him a fair shake here. So if Skull says, well, you know, the thing is these like diseases or these disorders, I mean, they're voted on, right? So you have a bunch of guys sitting in a room. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's some women included now. And then essentially they've on it they say okay we all agree that you know whatever percentage of the room we agree that this should be in the dsm right okay great uh so i okay i agree that that is a very somewhat not a very that is somewhat of a flawed way of uh medicalizing however here's the thing that i feel like skull uh and people like him proponents of uh they call this like the mad in america or whatever movement where uh, mm -hmm. the idea is that it's not necessarily it's it's too stigmatizing it's not necessarily mental illness uh it's more cultural whatever right so but again i don't want to devalue it uh so so, but just to say that the thing that I think Skull and the proponents of those theories miss is when you look at the DSM, it's so easy to say, okay, let's focus on this part of it where it's, let's say five out of the nine criteria, right? And, you know, they would say, well, who's to say, you know, why does it have to be five? Why can't it be four? Why can't it be all true? Very true. However, the part that they miss is on under section C of almost every single, so they used to call these the cluster A illnesses, uh, not so much anymore, but so like everything but the personality disorders. So when the cluster C of every single diagnosis there's a criteria that says, and you have to meet it in order to have this diagnosis, must cause clinically significant distress and or significantly impair functioning in a major area, whether mm -hmm. it's social, whether it's work, whether it's personal, whatever, right? So the point is because people tend to miss that, what they're not getting is it's not so much about the actual symptoms or the criteria. What they're saying is, okay, when a person meets five out of nine symptoms, there's a very, very high chance that they're going to be clinically significantly distressed. But the point is to say, if somebody meets those five symptoms in some world and then you don't have clinically significant impairment, again, you know, you're somehow able to be high functioning. I mean, look, at that point, even if the person says, well, you know what? I still want therapy. Great. However, they're not diagnosable at that point. So I find that the people who are like really opposed in these in the anti-psychiatry people, again, super, a lot of respect for Andrew Skull. Uh, but the thing is that what they miss is that like, yeah, if a person is coming into treatment and they're significantly distressed, I mean, can we probably agree that that probably is some sort of diagnosis or diagnosable illness. I mean, it just, I don't know. It would just be obvious to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I often feel like I'm in the position of defending the DSM, which is something mm -hmm. I'm actually critical. I'm really critical of the DSM, but it's really important to understand the difference between the DSM and just everyday life. You know, the, what, what's the goal of the DSM? What, what's its purpose? Its purpose is to help frame um, an understanding of somebody's clinical problems in order to drive a, a treatment, right? So unless you have a name of something, it's not going to drive a treatment. You got to have some 
we have some category. We're humans. We all have categories. We divide the world up. If we didn't, we couldn't even have this conversation. If we didn't mm -hmm. have categories, right? I've never seen your room before, but I can tell that that's a couch behind you, right? Is yeah. that what we call it? That, that looks like a couch. <laughs> no, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. How do I know it's a couch? Because I have this category, you know, in my head that that's what, what that is. If we didn't, you know, we couldn't have any conversation. I'd see you on the street. I'd say, how's the large, formless world today? And you'd say, it's large and without form. Goodbye. We could <laughs> talk, right? Um, the, the DSM is about framing things, but it's also about framing things for scientific studies so that when you have a research study going on in Iceland on people who have delusions and hallucinations, and that there's also a study going on in Tokyo with people mm -hmm. who have the similar symptoms and in Los Angeles, that those studies can be comparable because mm -hmm. you know you've got a similar population, similar mm -hmm. community using the same therapy, the same medicine, medicine. You're looking at the same type of person. And that's different from everyday life. So when a student comes into my office and says, I say, how are you? And they say, oh, I've got PTSD from my econ exam. <laughs> okay. I don't think that she really has, you know, the risk to herself, to her harming herself or to, to being impaired in sleep and eating and going out and, and having flashbacks. And I don't think that right? Because in anthropology, we call it ha having a folk model, mm -hmm. where you take a model of something and you just sort of apply it to everyday life, but it's different from the scientific one. Um, so, so, so that is different. She doesn't need therapy because of her midterm. Right. Right. Um, but there are people who really, really suffer. And if we didn't have a category or term for it, it'd be difficult to figure out how to provide something. A diagnosis is only as good as the benefit it provides. And we see that all the time. I tell the story in Nobody's Normal about a freshman mm -hmm. girl, a woman in my class, who said that the best day of her freshman year was when she was diagnosed with ADHD. Hmm. Well, why would that be a great, a great day? Why would that be so wonderful? Well, she said that her parents always told her that she wasn't working hard enough, or maybe she wasn't mm. that smart or mm. whatever. And she wanted to get therapy. And they're like, no, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. And so she gets to college where now she's on her own. And she goes to this counseling center at our university. And then they provided her with a referral. And she went to a clinical psychologist who diagnosed her with ADHD. And she said, for the first time in my life that I could remember, I didn't feel that I was lazy or didn't work hard enough or wasn't stupid or it was stupid. I realized that I just needed extra time on exams. Hmm. Wow. Or I needed, you know, an accommodation to get a little bit of help with how to sequence writing a paper or whatever it might've been. Um, and so having that diagnosis was incredibly helpful to her. We, of course, have to be careful about how diagnoses have been used against political dissidents in many countries and uh, to, um, uh, you know, to in the past to confine people to asylums and so on. But the spirit of the mental health professions really is, I think, you know, usually therapeutic. You know, it's when sometimes the basic scientists get lost or locked up in their lab that they might lose sight of it my grandfather was analyzed by sigmund freud and i have a whole what? yeah yeah, that's yeah, yeah i've got a whole chapter in nobody's normal about his analysis with freud mm -hmm. and he hated freud he said <laughs> he said freud didn't want to help anybody he had wow. no therapeutic intentions he didn't want to he, treat anybody. And when challenged on that, Freud would say, yeah, I, I really didn't go into this profession to help people. Uh, I went in to try to learn about the mind, you know, and the mm -hmm. structure of the mind. But that that really annoyed my grandfather who wanted treatment. And of course, my grandmother too, who wrote many letters to Freud saying he's not better. <laughs> what? So okay. 
now I have to ask like 10 million questions about this. Sure. Uh, okay. So wait, so first of all, uh, what did your grandfather get out of it? If anything, because I'm assuming there had to have been something since he kept going. Um, and then also, so what was Freud's intention in actually seeing patients? His intention in seeing patients was to, uh, to learn about the structure of the mind. Oh, to study and, them. Yeah. And that's what, one of the reasons why he was so interested in dreams. Wow. Um, because, hmm. Uh, dreams weren't sort of muddled up by too much everyday life. You know, he didn't like it when patients said, oh, I had a fight with my boss today or my colleague or my wife or husband or whatever. That was like, he just wanted to cut through that stuff and mm -hmm. get to the structure of the human mind. And the dream was perfect for that because you, you know, you can, you just tell the dream and you can try to figure out if you're Freud, you know, what, what the dream was about. And um, my grandfather um, talked to me a lot about dreams. And I, when I was like in sixth or seventh grade, mm -hmm. um, I decided I could analyze dreams. So I go to school. I'm like, tell me your dreams. Anybody tell me your dreams. And there was this, um, there were these people and they would tell me dreams and I would come up with, you know, really simplistic analyses. And uh, there was this one kid, I've never actually followed up. His name was John Balaha. And he came up to me and he said, this is in Chicago. And he said, I had a dream about a red bear that escaped. And then I found it and it tried to kill me, but I outsmarted the bear. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that's a dream about your competition with your father. Because your dad's got red hair. <laughs> your dad's wow. got red hair. <laughs> and, and John says, well, the, the joke's on you, Grinker, because... <laughs> I didn't have that dream. I just made it up. Uh, said, but it, you you made it up just like you make up a dream. Like it still came from your mind. Uh, it's your stuff, your unconscious stuff. I love it. Oh my God, what a reframe. Yeah, well, at which point he punched me. <laughs> I, had tried, I was a huge That's bruise. I tried to hide it from my mother. Yeah. She found the bruise somehow. She swore, you know, made me swear not to analyze anybody's dreams. But the point is that even, um, you know, that was why the dream was was so important. That's why myths were so important for Claude Levi-Strauss, if, if the the famous structuralist um, anthropologist and philosopher. That you want to get rid of all the crap, the, the the muddled stuff of everyday life, and sort of get at the structure of the mind. Mm. That's why uh, my grandfather didn't like Freud, uh, in part. Right, right. The other reason he didn't like Freud is because he. Freud was very much like his own father in, a, in his personality. Mm. And my grandfather had a very difficult um, and rather abusive uh, relationship with his own father, my great grandfather, who I never met. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, and so what did my grandfather did get out of the uh, analysis in Vienna in the early 30s was number one, um, that he was able to work through a lot of his issues with his dad, who mm. had died just before the he went to Vienna, um, because Freud was so much like him, it helped mm. and resolve some of those issues. I wow. uh, don't know if Freud intentionally made himself like my great grandfather or not. And then the second thing he got out of it is he came back to the United States and he was kind of a minor celebrity in mm. mental health, right? Because Freud was already famous. And he has uh, oh my god i'm sorry i just don't want to keep harping on this but my mind tells me you have to ask okay so i know right well that and then also you yeah, right but the, yeah actually that so okay so freud gets an understanding of, a, the, of uh, the mental structure or whatever the purpose of i don't know the purpose of the mind or whatnot right to what end so if you're not helping people what's the point what was he looking for celebrity fame riches what freud he was looking for a theory of of the human mind and mm -hmm. and and how it was that all human beings um made sense of the world and motivated their behavior for reasons they were unaware of mm. i mean yeah, it was, it was it's, it's, it's in this in the same way that people you know like levi strauss analyzed myths you know why why is it that we have these myths so let's say you have a question like um as freud did um, why is uh, Hamlet such a popular play? Um, think of all the plays and stories that have been written over the ages, millions of them, mm -hmm. only certain ones kind of resonate with us. Mm -hmm. And so Freud would say, okay, so why does this story resonate with us? Mm 
-hmm. the Oedipus story. Many, many versions of the Oedipus story have been told for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Why does that story persist? Mm -hmm. What well, must be that there's something universal in us that mm -hmm. resonates with it. It must do something for us. Mm -hmm. And that's why Freud was so interested in Oedipus, um, because he thought that that story's persistence over all of these years told us something about the structure of the human mind over the course of of child development mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. so um you could learn and then if he had patients who he thought had oedipus complexes well that just obviously reinforced the idea that we as children you know compete with one parent to gain the intense affection of the other parent mm. And did your grandfather ever tell you uh, how his relationship with Freud was able to, or what caused him to resolve his relationship with his, with his own dad? Uh, no, that's my interpretation. Oh, okay, okay. Of it, he just he just told me how much he you know disliked Freud. Mm -hmm. um, yet he used Freud, you know, for his own career, right? Um, and um, but I think it it was a successful analysis because he was able to resolve his issues enough with his father to become a psychiatrist mm. which um and a psychoanalyst which his own father had had said um you'll do over my dead body <laughs> well um so after his his father died um he he said well now i can become a psychoanalyst because you're dead wow and, um, and he did and freud was this new sort of you know father figure for him Mm -hmm. and so yeah. he came back to chicago and he launched uh psychiatry at the university of chicago um he he founded uh and was the uh, he was the founding editor um and worked as an editor for 15 the editor-in-chief for 15 years of the archives of general psychiatry which today mm -hmm. is called jama psychiatry it's the mm -hmm. premier um psychiatric journal yeah. and then you had my father who he told would be also an analyst and then he inscribed one of his books to me when I was like six or seven and couldn't even read full sentences saying, you're going to be a great psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We kind of are. That's what's so interesting. You kind yeah, of just very yeah, sort yeah. of roundabout. Yeah, roundabout. Well, I always have to tell people I don't treat anybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, going back to that uh, college uh, student who yeah. found it very freeing to have that identification of ADHD ascribed to her, right? She's like, oh, okay, like this is my understanding. Oh, I actually know what's going on with me now. This is this is incredible. Before I thought uh, yeah. I was just lazy. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. My parents are right. Now I know what's going on with me. Now I know how to approach this. That's beautiful. Um, do you think that also there, it's sort of a double-edged sword though in being able to identify or at least be ascribed a certain diagnosis or mental illness in the sense that, for example, say uh, you're, somebody is told, oh, uh, you have a generalized anxiety disorder. Oh, you are bipolar. You are this, you are that. And then you might, that person, that individual might begin to sort of identify uh, with that. And then maybe that, that might actually do more harm than, than good in the sense that, oh, uh, I can't do anything about this uh, now. I, I, that's it. I have anxiety. Oh, I'm bipolar. Like yeah, that it, kind of. Idea. It would elicit a sense of shame, right? Potentially. Okay. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. Increasingly, that's less the case, which I is why it. I wrote the book, which is to say, right. why is it that people are feeling that that's a good thing now? And it does, doesn't seem to do as much harm and it seems to be m much more helpful. Mm. Um, and we're back to the folk model, too. Why mm. would a 50 year old get a diagnosis of autism? Lots of people who are 50, 60 years old are now getting diagnoses with autism. There's no special education program for them because they're out of school. Right. There's no government service that they're entitled to for autism because they're too old. Um, why would it? Why would they seek it? Some They might even go to 10 different doctors till somebody finally says, okay, you, you, I can say you meet the criteria for autism because it provides that benefit of an explanatory framework. Hmm. I've always felt different or I've always felt this way and I just didn't understand it. But in a different kind of society, yes. So you can it can do great harm. 
So when I when I first started studying autism in uh, the um, like late 90s, early 2000s, very, very beginning stages of, of 2000s, um, I got involved with um, an epidemiologic study. So mm -hmm. I wrote a grant and I, I found colleagues and we put together an epidemiologic study of autism. And um, it, we were going to do it in Korea. And we eventually did. It was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2011. But at that point, if you were doing an epidemiologic study, you've got to tell the parents if the psychiatrists on your team have diagnosed the person with autism or not mm -hmm. to diagnose their child. And it was a very shameful and difficult diagnosis at the time. And so it didn't do much help mm -hmm. in terms of immediately, at least. You know, in terms of helping families, what it did do was it made a, a big impact in epidemiologic studies that I think it had, a, I, you know, I think the, the study was really important in helping us see that the rates that we thought were average were really very low. Mm -hmm. um, but then it did help over time. I think that we contributed to the growth of autism as a non-stigmatized category in Korea. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, you diagnose with somebody, you diagnose that World War I off a, a, a pilot mm -hmm. with um, hysteria, mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to do harm. Right. But you get a less stigmatized or a non-stigmatized diagnosis like shell shock. Mm -hmm helps them it gives them a sense of value yeah shell shock i was a a victim of of war i was fighting for whatever and 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 i've got some honor there's some honor associated with it right ptsd no longer is a sign of you being weak right 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 ptsd is not about weakness anymore it was right on the other hand yes it can change the way you think about yourself sure um, there's a famous study um, that a sociologist did in the, I want to say the 60s, called The Making of Blind Men. Mm -hmm. And it was about um, young men who entered schools for the blind. And um, the majority of these men had some residual vision, pretty, you know, they were they were technically blind, but could sort of see a little bit, some of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, apologies if you hear a dog barking. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay. <laughs> but uh, what was interesting is that um, the sociologist, Robert Smith, found that once these um, uh, boys, young men went to the school for the blind, they just stopped using their vision. Hmm. Because now they saw themselves, so no pun intended, that they, 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 they viewed themselves as, as blind. Hmm, and that identity changed the way that they existed in the world. They didn't even use the, the vision anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the analog to that would be, you know, if we had a diagnosis, well, you have ADHD, and then you said to yourself, oh, well, then that means I better drop out of college because I'm incapable of graduating. But we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, and the distinction there, and I think I, I, I guess that's why people really struggle with it because we we tend to compare uh, upwards where we're looking at you know how are people better than us or whatnot. Yeah. So what's so interesting is that like you know if you're a person who is let's say autistic and you don't know that there's another way to exist in the world, I mean you're not necessarily going to think of it as a bad thing. But it's sort of like you know the Plato ca Plato's cave analogy. You know once you sort of see the light and what else is out there, and people make you feel ashamed of it, then all of a sudden you're like oh wow like this is really horrendous. And you know what's so interesting is how subjective this all is there's um oh my god i don't want to say her name because i'm going to butcher it but there's this really great documentary on the person who was the first black model to ever appear on vogue magazine and so what's so interesting about her story is that I, her name is i think donna lynn or something like donna luna or something like that i don't want to butcher it whatever so but the point is to say uh that what happened with her is that in her initial environment so she was in uh the inner city of detroit and so her initial environment they, they pretty much shunned her they bullied her she was called ugly whatever and then she gets into let's say well, she goes to new york city at some point she goes into London and now she's like the most beautiful thing in the world and she is considered to be like a Marilyn Monroe's level in terms of beauty so what's so interesting again is that it's like a lot of these uh diagnoses labels whatever they are not necessarily stigmatizing in and of themselves it's only when somebody points a mirror to you and in a way kind of distorts it or shapes the way you see it so it's not just a mirror it's not saying oh hey this is like what you are it's hey this is what I think about what you are 
Yeah, and we talk, sometimes talk about um, the environment or the social environment um, with the phrase, the social model of disability. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's where uh, you're not necessarily um, valued negatively or you're not necessarily impaired unless your environment makes it so. Right. Right. So is somebody who's differently able and uses a wheelchair disabled if there are elevators and ramps everywhere? Well, technically not, right? Because right. it's normalized. There's, there's no impediment, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, what disability studies scholars and um, advocates and activists have done, and the neurodiversity movement has done this, is they've drawn on the social model of disability to um, say that uh, we just have to change our understanding that it's not the individual, who, there's not something wrong with the individual necessarily, but something is wrong with the environment in which that person exists. So we change the environment, things will be will be different. We ch did change the environment for all kinds of things, whether it's ADHD or autism, so that things are different. You know, I have a child with autism. Well, child, she was, she, she just turned 32. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I, uh, I look at uh, families with kids with autism today, and there's a little bit of jealousy. I'm thinking, oh, you're going to have it so much better. You might have to fight less hard. You might have to struggle less. You might have to not explain all the time what autism is mm -hmm. um, because we've made such improvements. A lot of books out there are about how bad things are, right? Mm -hmm. And this book, Nobody's Normal, is really about how much progress we've made um, on num so many different fronts yeah. um, to, you know, to, to make it so that um, our environment, our social um settings don't disable us no totally and uh, mental health awareness uh, has gained incredible momentum uh in the past several years and still has that momentum going a uh, huge advocacy uh, behind it um being that we've already accomplished uh so much uh what work do you think remains to be done if, if you had to say well i think one thing that really um needs to be done is to figure out how to apply lessons learned here mm. in other countries and take ah, okay. the lessons from other countries and apply them here um, to, to go back and forth. Uh, there's a lot of hubris out there, you know, in scientific communities where they think, well, our, our way of providing treatment is the right way or the only way or the best way. Mm. Um, and so I really applaud those scholars and scientists who were looking in other places in the world and saying, how do we make it possible to reduce stigma? Um, if I'm a, 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 you know, a university professor, a mental health professional, I'm probably talking to other mental health professionals in other countries and mm. I'm publishing in the best journals and, and, and I'm having a a dialogue with people at this very kind of um, high level of science and scholarship, but who's actually on the front lines in a rural setting dealing with somebody right. suffering from a mental illness? That's mm. probably not the, you know, the university of psychiatrist who's reading my latest article in the, you know, American Journal of Psychiatry. Right. And so there really needs to be, I think, a lot more work on figuring out how to improve mental health uh, knowledge and treatment for people who are at the front lines who may just be healthcare workers with not, maybe not even an advanced degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anybody listening to this podcast can say, oh yeah, maybe psychiatry's made a lot of uh, a progress, but I can't get an appointment with anybody. Mm -hmm. I can't find a doctor and I can't get my insurance to reimburse and so yeah mental health treatment is great but how do you get it mm -hmm. um, Interesting. think how hard that is for communities 
um, in which you don't have anybody out there. Um, yeah, I tell the story. Yeah. I don't know if we have more time. Oh, I, please, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. I tell the story. Um, uh, I did it, it's I did a sh short piece for the LA Times, um, but I write about it more in Nobody's Normal um, about a, a young psychiatrist uh, named um, uh, Dr. Koirala, who's from Nepal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was trying to talk to the doctors and a lot of the foreign uh, medical professionals who were coming in with non-governmental organizations to try and provide mental health care. And he was trying to convince them that mental illness was so stigmatized in Nepal that it was not going to do them any good to try to find people with mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't agree with him at first. And they went out to this rural area and they put up like a big tented kind of clinic. And it said something like, clinic for mental illnesses. Nobody came. Wow. And Corolla said, you know, the thing is that in Nepal, a lot of people, most people, he said, they don't experience their emotional distress in terms of like anxiety, depression. They don't conceptualize it that way. They're, they're, they're experiencing their distress the way Americans used to almost all the time. And a lot of us still do. Stomach distress, headaches, fatigue, other sorts of things. And so they left and he puts, he goes back to the same place and he puts up another little makeshift clinic and mm -hmm. he says, headache and fatigue clinic. Mm -hmm. And it was just a line of people to but get in. Thing. And he said they had depression and they had anxiety and they had all of these stressors and that he was able to um, help them with. Um, and it's because he didn't just assume that what works in Washington, D.C. is going to work in rural Nepal. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that that pressing need internationally that, you know, I hope that um, that I hope that grows a lot in the coming years because there is mental illness everywhere in the world. Um, and, uh, and it generally goes on, even goes untreated in the United States as we know. Yeah. Then and that, that's interesting. Then the role of language here is actually fascinating because, uh, when it stopped being called a, you know, a, a center for mel men mental illness rather, uh, and it was more of a, like a headache and stomach distress center, people came, right. Um, then that makes me wonder, uh, is there anything that we can do with the, the language behind, you know, sort of the, for example, if we call something a mental illness, rather than framing that whatever's trying to be accomplished is for mental health, does the framing matter in terms of the language use or language pattern? Good question. Yeah, our language, I mean, it is interesting that we, we we're even afraid of the term mental illness here, right? Right. Uh, the U.S. We we have the National Institute for Cancer and the National Institute for um, Infectious Diseases and Allergy and Substance Abuse, but we have the National Institute of Mental Health, right? The National Institute of Mental Illness. That's right. it itself been uh, a fraught term. But um, one of the major issues that I think um, uh, healthcare providers face in the United States is that uh, patients. Uh, continue to see um, uh, mental illnesses as, or, or as symptoms of mental illnesses is somehow made up mm -hmm. or not real. Mm -hmm. So if you're in Nepal going to Dr. Koirala's clinic and you say you have uh, fatigue and a headache and he says, oh, that's anxiety and I'm going to give you something for that anxiety, that's not seen as negatively as it is in the United States, where if you mm -hmm. go to your primary care physician and say that you have fatigue and a headache, and they say, maybe you have anxiety, and let's put you on an SSRI, they say, are you saying that my symptoms aren't real? Mm -hmm. huh. That that I, I don't really, there's not something biologically wrong with me? Mm -hmm. You know, we continue to have this kind of separation between body and mind, as if um, illnesses of the body are totally separate separate from illnesses of the mind and mm -hmm. one is real and the other is kind of made up you know this happens all the time and yet 
most most people who go to primary care physicians for a symptom are usually, you know, if it's not for their their checkup, it's for something that could possibly be related to a psychological issue. Yeah. And I think the other major issues, is there's a distinction between the mind and the environment. So what I don't get is how there's such a war battle, whatever you want to call it between. So people that are proponents of the more sort of medical biological model, and then the kind of more social justice oriented people. So there, so like we had Judith Herman on. Uh, so Judith Herman, a famous psychiatrist, a brilliant woman. I agree with pretty much everything she says. Uh, so her fo focus is more, let's say conceptually, it's more environmental. So she talks about, uh, so she says for the most part, I don't want to butcher this. Or I don't want to misquote her, but I think she says something along the lines of like, look, you know, biology is important, but what's more important is how people are treated. Something along those lines, uh, which I totally agree with. But what I don't understand, and I'm not saying she's a part of this, so I just wanted to use her as an example. But what I don't understand is why on the one hand, you have people who are saying, well, you know, so like, let's say people who are against personality disorders, so they'll say something like, well, you know, of course, these people suffer this, like this is trauma, right? These are like their lives or whatnot. And then you have the more biologically oriented folks who are like, well, you know, if you kind of look at the data, a lot of people have personality disorders, even when they don't necessarily have trauma, right? Which obviously doesn't necessarily mean that trauma doesn't or work as a trigger. It just means that for whatever reason, that wasn't a part of that sort of melting pot that brought about it, brought it about for some people. So what I don't understand is why is there such a kind of, at least in, you know, kind of the popular forum, why there's a battle between the two sides? Because ultimately, when you ask any psychiatrist, clinician of any sorts of, you know, honestly, to be frank, uh, they'll tell you that we prescribe, we subscribe to the bi biopsychosocial model. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that, yeah, you have a little bit of genetics where there's predispositions. So we'll see that some people are definitely more sensitive than others. Uh, and then you'll also have, uh, let's say on top of that, you know, let's say an invalidating environment doesn't necessarily have to be capital T trauma. But if let's say the kid is neglected, uh, let's say the kid is uh, not necessarily ostracized, but felt as though they're not an important member of the family, their needs aren't taken seriously with the sensitivity, they have a heightened risk of developing, let's say, borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. But even still, those are that you can't even actually predict who will and won't get it because then there are people who do have sensitivities and they don't have a full-blown BPD. So my point is to say, I just, I wonder why there's such a distinction between environment and biology when you can't really say that everybody who's in a particular environment is automatically going to, let's say, experience PTSD. So war veterans is a good example. Uh, the social justice people will say, well, if you were in Vietnam, of course you would have PTSD. That's not what the data shows. The data shows, I think only about 10% of the veterans had PTSD. That's, I mean, it's a large number number of people, but percentage wise, it's fairly small. So what I'm saying is that it's interesting that like you have these two sides that are both, they're, they're both proponents of the truth or some semblance or some part of the truth. And yet they continuously battle each other and say, I guess in some ways, like, Hey, you know, you guys are demonizing uh, mental, uh, mentally ill people because you're stigmatizing them by saying it's their biology implying in some ways it's their fault, which I don't think is happening. And then on the other end, you have the uh, people who are, let's say, uh, the more kind of biologically oriented folks. And they're saying, you know, well, you know, you're not taking seriously the brain chemistry. And what you're doing is you're saying the medications don't matter. Uh, and you're pretty much stigmatizing people as well, because you're saying if they take medications, uh, somehow, you know, they're stupid, or they don't understand like what causes problems, they don't understand how social structures work, whatever. I don't get it, because it's all of it. It's all of these things. All of these things are true to some extent. They are. I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, we might be getting back to the DSM here because the DSM, uh, one, you said that, you know, one of the things that's all that's in the criteria of the DSM is that it's, there's some clinical relevance mm -hmm. uh, uh, to these symptoms. But another thing is that in the DSM is that uh, with the couple of exceptions, like grief disorder and substance abuse, uh, with just, just a couple exceptions, everything in the DSM is something without a cause, without a known cause. And the moment that we're going to find some sort of genetic thing that says, oh, this single gene causes this particular condition, it's taken out of the DSM. Mm -hmm. And it's put in the, you know, just the international classification of diseases. Right. Um, and so for the moment, we have the, this, this, these ideas of uh, in the DSM of these conditions being biopsychosocial, but without any clear, yep. um, clear cause. Um, my book is crit is kind of critical of the whole body mind distinction in general, 
you know, and we could go back and blame Descartes mm. and say, well, it's his fault because before, before that, you know, the body and the mind were, you know, together. And, you know, once we got to World War I, uh, people were still experiencing emotional distress through the body. But by the time Freud comes around and we get the psychoanalytic paradigm, we end up getting an even more clear distinction between the mind and the body, that there are diseases of the mind, there are diseases of the body, and they don't meet. Um, we know this to be a false distinction. I think the pl one place where research is going to be really fascinating um, in the future is in epigenetic research. We all learned that now, and as, a, as an anthropologist, you know, in my I'm not a biological anthropologist, but in my discipline, we're really into epigenetics because, you know, we're 99 point whatever percent identical to chimps, mm -hmm. and but yet the only genes that have been clearly identified as distinct have to do with things like arm length and jaw size and not cognition or language or things like that. So it's what genes are getting turned on, turned off, that's going to be the key to understanding that in our field. But in terms of mental illness, um, you know, we all learned the difference between Darwin and Lamarck, right? Mm -hmm. We learned that Lamarck was wrong to say that you could pass on genetically things that were acquired, traits that were, acqui were acquired during your life. So if today, so I have five fingers, but if today I had a terrible accident and I lost a finger and then I father a child, the child's not going to be born with four fingers, mm -hmm. right? I acquired that trait, but I'm not going to pass it on to my child. So we know that, that in that regard, Lamarck was wrong. But what uh, biological um, psychiatrists are finding is, um, and Rachel Yehuda would be a really great person to interview on this because she's worked so much with um, uh, veterans and Holocaust survivors, is that trauma experienced in one generation can change the way in which genes function hmm. in the next generation. So adverse childhood circumstances, other kinds of trauma can predispose people to mental illnesses in the next generation. And that's, I think, where we're going to find a lot of progress. A lot of that work now is done sort of at the the animal model level, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you like expose, uh, say, um, a rat to a particular uh, negative, uh, you have a stimulus and then a negative result to that stimulus. Um, and then you have that rat reproduce with another rat that has not been exposed to that stimulus and they have mm -hmm. a baby and the little and the pup also is born with uh, a negative reaction to that stimulus. But we haven't, you know, I'm not, I think that there will be a lot of good biological research on on humans and not just in non-human animal models in the future. And that's that that'll be some progress. But you know, in terms of body and mind, body and environment, uh, mind and environment, you can look up all these cases of unexplained um, bodily ailments or unexplained mental illness symptoms and see this division that that you find so perplexing persisting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's the Havana syndrome, um, uh, the, in, the thing in Cuba where it was thought that microwaves were being used to, to harm diplomats or the cheerleaders in Leroy, Michigan that Susan Dominus um, wrote about in the New York Times who yep. all experienced um, non-epileptic seizures and, um, and language difficulties and, and motor uh, uh, impairments, um, that anytime one suggests that there's a psychological component to it, there's a swift backlash. Mm -hmm. No, it can't be because you know these people were suffering from x y or z or can't uh you know independent of this purported cause it can't be that these cheerleaders in Leroy Michigan were having stress after all they were cheerleaders and they were getting good grades they probably had no stress but um i think that's a, a huge problem because you know at the risk of repeating myself 
even today in the United States, so much mental distress is experienced through bodily symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, okay. Wow, man. There's so much, so many gems in this episode. Uh, so, okay. I feel like we're kind of already at time. Uh, yeah, I, I promised you I had five more questions, but let's, yeah. Well, I, I sorry you. if I, I'm sorry if I spoke, to, uh, my answers were too long no 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 this, no, so, no 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 this was awesome yeah yeah this so, was great okay. so <laughs> many so many gems yeah and i feel like I'm, even on the just the freud topic we could go on forever uh okay so as we start to wrap up alan final questions for richard before we go ah uh, yes so if we wanted to follow you follow your work and of course buy the book uh, where can we do that well i'm not a huge social media person but the best way to um uh counter my work is to you know go on Amazon or your nearest bookseller. Um, Nobody's Normal is uh, my newest book and it's available uh, on an audio uh, book. Uh, it's a professional narrator, not me. Um, and it's also available in paperback. And if you are not an, uh, a person who wants to read everything in English, but wants to read in Turkish or Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Portuguese, uh, Russian, um, mm -hmm my books are available in those languages as well. I love awesome. it. Richard, thank you so much, this man. Is this is such an insightful mm -hmm. podcast. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. Take right, care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So everyone, if you'd like to follow us, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram, on Twitter, where Seize underscore podcast like subscribe hit, hit the, the bell, bell on, on YouTube. youtube and again thank you so much for watching and see you next time